Okay, so this is chapter 12. Oops, sorry guys. Oops. This is chapter... <laughs> uh, hold on. Chapter 12 in the 9th edition and chapter 13 in the 10th edition. So there are lots of things we have to take into consideration when we try to figure out how to control microorganisms. So some of the things that we have to take into consideration is how fast organisms can actually die. So, wait a minute, my pen's not working. Okay, how fast, how fast they die. Okay, how many organisms are present and how they're arranged. So it depends on the amount of biomass. So if you think about a biofilm, so when things are in a biofilm, right, they're in they're in layers. So when they're in there's layers, it's harder to get and you have to have an antibiotic or antiseptic or disinfectant that's going to be able to penetrate those layers. Okay, another thing that's going to influence it is organic materials. So are is the pathogen in vomit? Is it in blood? Is it in feces? Okay, and then we have to look at and this one to me seems kind of common sense, right? We have to see how susceptible it is to whatever you're trying to kill it with. Okay, and all those things are related to time. Okay, so how long does it take? What the pH of the solution is, what the temperature is, and the concentration of the antimicrobial agent. So all this is kind of, I feel like it's kind of common sense. Okay, now here's some vocabulary. So static, so sometimes antimicrobial agents are referred to as static, and sometimes they use cidal. So if something is static, what is happening is, if you look at this growth curve, right, so the black line is the normal growth curve, and then if you look at the yellow, or the blue, right, the blue is flat. So we're not killing off all of the organisms, but we're inhibiting their growth, we're slowing their growth. Where if something is cidal, right, cidal, we're killing it. So here are some examples. So bacteriostatic, fungostatic, virostatic. Things can be bactericidal, virocidal, and I put in here suicidal and homicidal. So you would relate those two things, relate cidal to death, that things are actually dying. Okay, now more vocabulary words. So whenever we start to talk about... Um, Sterilization. So sterilization is removing all of the microorganisms. So it's removing everything on an object or in like the media that we make. So we want to get rid of everything. If we disinfect, what we're doing is we're, we're reducing the number of pathogenic organisms so that they can't, there's not enough of them to cause disease. So it's not sterile, right, but it's disinfected. So the number of pathogens are reduced. Whoops, hold on. Okay, so now um, categories of agents are, we have a, like a little laundry list. Okay, so the first thing is antiseptics. So antiseptics, it's important to realize that they can, they can be added to living tissue. So you could put them on living tissue and not damage it. I'm trying to find a better stylus. You put them on living tissue and it's not going to damage the cells. So they're non-toxic to our cells, to our cells, the human cells, okay, but they're going to kill or inhibit the, the pathogens, so they could be static or cidal, okay, most of them aren't strong enough to destroy spores, so things like clostridium could still be there, okay, so here's some examples, so one is hydrogen peroxide, so the, the symbol for hydrogen peroxide is H2O2, so this is hydrogen peroxide, and I have um, whoops, bottles of it here. Okay, what you buy at the CVS or Walmart is 3% hydrogen peroxide, but you can get it a lot stronger. If you have a stronger strength, it can damage tissue and cause chemical burns. Okay, ethanol is another example of an antiseptic. 70% is actually the most effective ethanol. Um, 
well, between like 40 and 70. Okay, so 99%, it evaporates really fast. So it's not enough time to disinfect where the 70% has some water in it. So that's going to, um, it's going to stay a little bit longer. It'll break down the plasma membranes and help break down proteins, denature proteins. Okay, now disinfectants we use on inanimate objects. Okay, so they're usually at a higher concentration and they could damage tissue. So you don't want to put something like um, phenol or bleach on um, tissue. It'll damage it. Okay, another thing about disinfectants is they can remove toxins from the surface. If the microorganisms are dead, they can actually get rid of the toxins too. Okay, they don't usually kill spores, but bleach can break down clostridium spores. Okay, so examples, 5% bleach. So the active ingredient in bleach is sodium hypochlorite. Okay, so this chlorine part is going to be the active ingredient. Okay, most bleach that we buy, it's 5% sodium hypochlorite. Okay, then we sometimes we dilute it after that. Okay, then phenol is one of the first disinfectants. So Lister is the one that came up with that. So remember, Lister is considered the father of antiseptic or sterile technique in, in surgery. So he actually had kind of like a diffuser, and he put carbolic acid in it and spread it all throughout the room, kind of like create a mist of this phenol, which is actually very dangerous, not good. Um, it's a carcinogen. It can cause chemical burns if you get a bunch on your skin. But it disinfects. It kills everything. Okay, other disinfectants, so ethyl alcohol um, and chloramine. So I just have some little pictures. You guys don't have to memorize the um, memorize the chemical structures, but these are just different different things that break down, destroy bacteria. Okay, so more about alcohol. So I, there's two different kinds of alcohol. So there's isopropyl alcohol, which is rubbing alcohol, and then there's ethanol. So um, both of those work. The optimum concentration is between 60 and 90%, and they say that 70 is, is the best. So if you look at your hand sanitizers, they're usually about 68%. Um, if it's less than 50%, it doesn't work. It's not good. But it can um, kill the, the organism that causes tuberculosis. It can kill fungi. It can kill viruses or denature viruses, inactivate viruses, but doesn't usually kill spores. Um, the, what it does is it denatures the proteins, it dissolves plasma membranes. 100% um, it'll dry out the cells in the 99, but it's not on there long enough to destroy the proteins. Okay, hexachlorophane is an example. They call it physiohex. It's an example of a disinfectant that that is kind of bad. Okay, so it's a really, really good skin disinfectant. If you put it on your skin, it will kill staph and gram negatives. Um, it has phenols in it. So the phenols in it break apart the cell wall and disrupt the proteins. So it's going to kill organisms. Um, they used to use it when babies were born in the 60s. They would scrub them with physiohex to clean the skin. <laughs> so they were like disinfecting the babies and it actually got absorbed through the skin and it affects the central nervous system. So it caused problems with, with babies. They had um, learning um, difficulties. Okay, it is available. I mean, they still use it for skin disinfection, but it's not in infants anymore. Okay, now when we evaluate disinfectants, what we do is we compare it to phenol. So Lister, um, Lister introduced phenol as a disinfectant in 1867. So since it was like the first one, he considered it the gold standard. So we compare everything to phenol, even though phenol might not be the best anymore. 
Okay, so if something has a phenol coefficient of 1, that means it's as effective as phenol. So if you look at this chart, so phenol compared to phenol is 1. Okay, so phenol is effective against staph and salmonella. Okay, now some other things, right? So chloramine, um, cresol, ethyl alcohol, you can look at those and um, lysol, compare them with phenol. And pretty much everything is more is stronger than phenol except for peroxide. Okay, so we use the phenol as the gold standard. So they call it the phenol coefficient. Okay, so we're doing this in lab. So one way to evaluate how effective chemicals work is this thing called the filter paper method. So basically what we do is we're going to take a big petri dish and we're going to make a lawn of bacteria on it. So all of this is bacteria. And then we'll add some filter paper discs that are dipped into... Um, to different chemicals and then we're going to look for a zone of inhibition around the ring. So the bigger the zone, the more effective the chemical is. Okay, another test, and I don't know that I have this written out well, it's called a use dilution test. So what they do is you have the test bacteria, okay, and it's growing in a tube, and you dip these stainless steel, stainless steel little cylinders into the broth and get bacteria on them and then we take those and so this is the chemical okay and we take them out we rinse them okay and then we're going to put them in the um, chemical actually we don't rinse them before we put it in there we take them out of the um, broth we put it in the chemical then we rinse okay and then we'll put them in a tube with broth and we'll look to see if the organism actually grows. Okay, so the goal is to see what how dilute you could actually get the chemical and ha to have it still be effective, but make it have the best like cost benefit ratio. So you don't if you can use something more dilute and it's less hazardous to people, that's better than having something super duper concentrated. I hope that makes sense. Okay, so you take the stainless steel disc, you put it in the broth, then you'll put it in a chemical, and what you're trying to do is trying to see if the chemical will kill the organisms. Okay, then you rinse it off, okay, and get the chemical off, right, and then you put the stainless steel disc in another tube of broth, and you try to, and you shake it, and you try to see if the organism will grow that you initially started or if it's dead. Okay, so here's a list of things for an ideal disinfectant. Okay, so it has to be fast acting even if there's organic solids there. So if there's vomit or blood or tissue. Okay, it should be effective against a wide variety of pathogens, but it shouldn't damage the tissue or be poisonous to the person. Okay, it should penetrate the material, but it shouldn't damage it. It should be stable, um, so long-lasting, have a long shelf life, and easy to prepare. Okay, it should be inexpensive, easy to find, and then no unpleasant odor. Okay, so I have a couple little practice questions. So one of them says, are there degrees of sterility? So, no. <laughs> sterility is like either you're sterile and you don't have any organisms on you, or you're not sterile. So there's no gray in sterility. It's a yes or a no. Okay, and then this question is asking about phenol coefficient. So product A has a phenol coefficient of 2 and product B has one of 0.5. Which one's better? So A is better because it has a higher number. Okay, now how I'm going to stop here and upload. Okay, so this is the second part. Um, how, so how do chemical agents work? So these are kind of the same kind of the same thing. So they can either they can either denature proteins. Hold on, I'm trying to get the pen to write. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute, that's not working. <laughs> Hmm. 
one. Okay, so one that can denature proteins. So things that do that are typically acids and bases, or they could be an oxidizer. Okay, so things like peroxide, halogens, heavy metals, they oxidize. Okay, they could affect the membrane. So if you affect the membranes, right, everything is going to leak out of the cell. So things that do that are typically, these are all kind of in the same category, but they have different, just different terminology. So surfactants, detergents, and wetting agents. So typically they're like a, a soap. Okay, they can affect other cell components. So chelating agents interfere with DNA or RNA. Things like lactic acid inhibit fermentation, so it's changing the pH. And then some things affect that affect viruses, they either destroy their DNA or RNA, or they damage the proteins in them. So, chemical sterilants. So, if you have something like plastics or things that you can't heat up or you don't want to get wet, you can use chemical sterilants. So you can use sterilizers or sporicides. So lots of times they have a chamber like this, a cabinet. And the cabinet, you put your what you want to sterilize in the cabinet, and then you seal up the cabinet, and then you pump the gas into the cabinet. So it's like a gas chamber. But the things that go you put in there are maybe hydrogen peroxide or ethylene oxide or formaldehyde. And you kind of vaporize that those things, and then you exhaust the cabinet, and then after the cabinet is exhausted, then you should be able to take it out. So ethylene oxide is a common one. So like the Petri plates that we use, they come sterile. So um, ethylene oxide disrupts the proteins and the nucleic acids. It's nasty, right? It's a carcinogen. You can't smell it. You can't see it. It can blow up if there's a fire, um, but you use it to sterilize petri dishes, plastic containers, things that have electronics that need to be sterilized. Could, um, another okay, so this is another list of how things work. Okay, so soaps and detergents, um, the scrubbing motion, and the fact that think the soap is alkaline actually is what breaks down the pathogens. So there's a little blurb, maybe it's in the book now, about um, soap dispensers, like why we don't use bar soap in public places anymore, because the bacteria will grow on the bar soap. Um, examples of food preservatives, so lactic acid, propionic acid, benzoic acid, sorbic acid. So this is my, this was my bottle of Coke. <laughs> And if you look, so high fructose corn syrup, caramel color, and then phosphoric acid. So it's going to keep the pH low so nothing grows in there. Um, heavy metals are, they were some of the first um, antifungal agents. So in France, they were growing grapes for, to make wine, and they had a fungal infection on the grape vines. So they actually sprayed copper on it. And they figured out that the copper would kill the, the fungus. So these heavy metals will, will kill anything, really. So they're not good for the environment. But here's a, an oldie, but a goodie. Okay, so this was, merc it's called mercurochrome. So when I was a little girl, like my grandmother had it. So it's a tincture or a solution of mercury. So it's mercury in alcohol. And when you had a cut, instead of putting neosporin on it, you would, they would, there was like a little dipper thing in here and they would dip, dip the, dip this in the mercurochrome and spread it on your boo-boo. Okay, silver is used for burns now and for wounds. So silver nitrate is still used. Um, silver nitrate used to be used on babies' eyes when they were born. So they would put it after the baby was born, they were worried, you know, that it could have bacteria from passing through the vaginal canal. So they would put silver nitrate on their eyes to keep them from getting an eye infection. Now they use antibiotic solution, but 
silver nitrate is still around. Okay, halogens. So I want you to remember halogens are in the periodic table. They're right beside the noble gases. So halogens include things like chlorine, bromine, iodine. Okay, or I guess you should say iodine. Okay, so chlorine is used, it's in bleach, it's in um, the pool, right? You put it in the pool. Bromine, it dissociates at a higher temperature. It's kind of tougher than chlorine, so they put bromine in hot tubs. And then iodine, we do use betadine still to disinfect. Okay, now um, alcohols we've already talked about. So alcohols, it disinfects, it doesn't sterilize. Okay, it's better when it's about 70%. Phenols disrupt cell membranes and break down proteins. They're nasty, but there are some around. So orthophenol, phenol, phenol is in Lysol. So it actually lasts for seven days. Lysol is really good at, at disinfecting. Um, Cresol, I, I know, I always talk about this. This is in railroad ties. So they coat the railroad ties with, they don't want the wood to break down. So Cresol is used to coat the railroad ties. So fungus, fungi, and bacteria don't break them down. So here's more oxidizing agents, so sodium peroxide. And then a chelating agent, so that should be eight. So they disrupt um, nucleic acids, so formaldehyde, ethyl oxide, glutaraldehyde. Okay, so think about formaldehyde. Formaldehyde we use um, to preserve the cats, the specimens that we dissect. Okay, now physical, so this is not chemical now. We're going into physical antimicrobial agents. So heat can be used to kill things. Here's three definitions. So one is a thermal death point. So that's the temperature that kills the bacteria that are in a 24-hour-old culture in 10 minutes. Okay, so it's the temperature, but and you hold the temperature constant. So the temperature changes, the time stays constant, sorry. The time stays constant. Thermal death time is the time at a certain temperature. And then decimal reduction is the time to decimate a population. So it kills 90% of the population. So these are vocabulary words or, or terms. Okay, now if you have dry heat, it takes longer to disinfect things, but you would, or to sterilize, actually to sterilize. So you'd use it for metals, glass, things that you might not want to get wet, that you want to be dry, so oils, powders, things that you don't want um, moisture in. So 171 degrees Celsius, which is really hot for an hour, 160 Celsius for two hours, or 121 Celsius for 16 hours. Okay, now you can flame things. So like when we use our incinerator, that's dry heat. You just, when you use a flame, you want to avoid aerosols. You don't want to heat something up and then inhale an aerosol from something bad or something pathogenic. Okay, moist heat, so you can boil water. So you boil it, okay, and that sterilizes it. The autoclave is how a lot of places sterilize tools and media equipment. Okay, so the autoclave, we want to go to 121 degrees Celsius, and we increase the pressure in it. So it's between 15 pounds and 20 pounds per square inch. And depending on how much you have in there determines how long you actually autoclave it. But 20 minutes should be enough. The autoclave should kill spores. Okay, now, anytime you use an oven or an autoclave, you have to make sure that it's validated. So the idea is you need to make sure that the, the piece of equipment is doing what it's supposed to do. So you want all of the areas in the autoclave to be the same temperature. So it doesn't matter if your, if your, your um, tool is in the front or it's in the back. It should all be heated evenly, right? 
So, and there have been things happen with drug production where there have been problems with the autoclave and something hasn't been sterilized the way it should be. Okay, now, pasteurization is the idea. So this is Pasteur, right? So Louis Pasteur, he was working with wine and he knew that you could get like you needed the good bacteria in order to ferment to get wine, but if the bad bacteria, bad yeast were in there, right, it would make the wine rancid or the grape juice rancid. So he came up with the idea, right, that you heat things up to a high temperature for a short period of time, and that would be enough to kill the pathogens, but it would still leave some organisms in there. Okay, so we pasteurize milk, we pasteurize cider, okay? So it's not sterilizing, it's just getting rid of a high number of pathogens. Okay, so remember when we buy milk, though, right, because it's just pasteurized, we have to keep it in the refrigerator. So I have a question on here, can you buy sterile milk? Yes, there's milk that they sell that's on the shelf that's kept at room temperature, and that milk, in order to be kept that way, would have to be sterile. Okay, now, we can cool things down, but if we cool things down, we're not killing anything. We're just slowing its growth down. So we're just kind of keep slowing it down. Okay, so refrigeration is about 4 degrees Celsius. Freezing in a normal freezer is about 20 degrees Celsius. Okay, we can dry things. But when we add water to it, the, the bacteria can grow again. Okay, and freeze-drying is drying and under a vacuum. So freeze-drying, you guys have all seen like freeze-dried ice cream, right? To dry it under a vacuum. If you add water to it, you'll get it. You'll, you'll end up with bacteria again. Okay, radiation. So UV light. So if you think about... I can't remember if I talked about this. Okay, so here's purple. Shoot. Here's purple, right? And then we go to red on the visible light spectrum. So here's visible. So down below purple is UV or ultraviolet. It has a lot of energy. Okay, so the waves, the wavelengths are very small. So that energy can damage the DNA. Okay, so this picture is a plate. It had bacteria spread over it, and then parts of it were covered, and parts of it were treated with UV light. So the UV light kills the organism. Okay, some of them survived, so they mutated. Okay, we can also um, kill things using ionize, ionizing radiation, so that would be coming from a radioactive material or x-rays. So, like, uh, meat is ra is treated with the UV light. Okay, so meat is radiated so that it increases the shelf life. Okay, now, sonication is using ultrasound. And what it does is the ultrasound waves break apart the cells. Okay, so son sonication... Um, breaks apart the cells. Filtration, so we can use different size filters. The filters that I want you to know are this 0.22 micron. So 0.22 micron is the magic number that will actually, only things that will pass through that you might end up with are viruses and maybe some molecules. Okay, but the bacteria can't go through them, so they're captured by it. Okay, now osmotic control is like putting things in a hypertonic solution, like if you're salting something or making pickles. Okay, so that's been around. That's a way to slow the growth of organisms. It's been around for a really, really long time.